Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. All right, so we're going to start in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, through chapter 2, verse 10. Beautiful. Awesome. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Give us that good internet connection, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we pray. So 1 Corinthians 26, verses uh, to chapter 2, verse 10, it's going to be doing, I'm going to be giving it out of the Message Bible translation, because I really believe, you know, being a Greek student, I'm looking at the Greek words in here, and I'm looking at the, the construction of it, and I can see no better rendition of it's just, it's almost like a I don't know I would say like a commentary in a sense but it's not it's a very very good translation actually it's used in it's it's put in like common English so we can understand too and I, I'm doing this for a purpose because I want you to understand what the truth is first Corinthians 26 through chapter 2 verse 10 in the message Bible translation take a good look friends at who you were when you got called into this life. I don't see many of the brightest and the best among you, not many influential, not many from high society families. Isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women from the culture that the culture overlooks and exploits and abuses and chose these nobodies, quote unquote, uh, to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies, quote-unquote, okay? So God uses the quote-unquote nobodies to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies, the people who say they're somebodies, you know. They've got status, they've got a name out there. That makes it quite clear that none of you can get by with blowing your own horn before God. Everything that we have Right thinking, the right living, a clean slate, and a fresh start comes from God by way of Jesus Christ. Not by works of the law, but by Jesus Christ. That's why we have the saying, if you're going to blow a horn, blow a trumpet for God, not for yourself. I love this translation. You'll remember, friends, that when I first came to you to let you in on God's master stroke, I did not try to impress you with polished speeches and the latest philosophy. I deliberately kept in plain and simple. You know, I was just talking to a dear friend of mine about that not too long ago, that you know, Jesus always kept it plain and simple. The more plain and simple it is, the more profound it is. And that's the way the gospel is, that Paul says that lest we pervert the simplicity of the gospel, and so he kept it deliberately plain and simple so no one could mistranslate his words. No one could say that he didn't say that or he said this and it wasn't, didn't happen. It says, first Jesus is what he spoke and who he is. Then Jesus and what he did, that he was crucified. Now, the question is why can't we hear that every time we go to church? Now, th see, what I'm doing here is I'm giving you this scripture because this is a pattern on how a minister should approach the people of God. Now, take this illustration as I'm reading it in contrast to the polished out $6,000 tailored suits with diamond cufflinks and a Rolex presidential watch with a limousine outside that's parked outside, right? Okay. I'm just saying. This is how Paul came. This is how Jesus came. What makes us any better is my question. So, so then he says, uh, uh, so that was all I cared about was who Jesus is and what he did and that he was crucified. Now, I wasn't sure of how to go about this. I felt totally inadequate. How many preachers can attest to that? I... I think every time I've preached, I don't know how many times I could, 
thousands of times have preached and I've always feel inadequate. Always. Always. And I always say, Lord, I need I need your Holy Spirit. I can't do this without you, you know. I was scared to death, he said, if you want the truth of it. And so nothing I said could have been impressed you or anyone else. That's the truth. He said, nothing I could have said would have impressed you or anyone else. But the message that came through anyway was by God's spirit and God's power. He did it, which made it clear that your life of faith is a response to God's power, not some fancy mental or emotional footwork by me or anyone else. I, I that started thinking of the footwork when they dance, you know, on the stage when they're asking for, for millions of dollars from people. That's that's kind of <laughs> sorry for laughing, but it just reminds me of that. Uh, <laughs> it's just hilarious because this is like spelling it out, you know. Because we, of course, have plenty of wisdom to pass on to you once you get your feet on firm spiritual ground. But it's not popular wisdom. He's basically saying it's spiritual wisdom. It's not the fashionable wisdom like what's out there in society and what society says is wisdom of high-priced experts that will be out of date within a year or so. God's wisdom is something mysterious that goes deep into the interior of his purposes. You don't find it lying around on the surface. It's not the latest message in the headlines, but more like the oldest what God determined as the way to bring out his best in us long before we ever arrived on the scene, the experts of our day haven't got a clue about what this eternal plan is. If they had, they wouldn't have killed the master of the God-designed life on the cross. You see? That's why the scripture of the text says no one has ever seen or ever heard anything like this no so much as imagined anything quite like it, what God has arranged for those who love him, but you have seen it and heard it by God. His spirit has brought it all out in the open before you. So it takes God's Holy Spirit to bring even simple truth. Now we just read it. Even simple truth, it takes God's Holy Spirit to open up your eyes to see even simple truth, because the natural man perceiveth not the things of the Spirit. We'll start using King James Version. So, enough of the new message. But it was a good translation, actually, of the text and how our language is, so we can really fully understand what he was trying to convey there. Now, next scripture, Matthew 24, 24 through 26. If you have your Bibles, I'll wait for you for a second. And if you're watching replay, then you hit pause. Matthew 24, chapter 24, verse 24 through 26. Then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Now, is Jesus right in what he said? Yes. Is Jesus correct in all that he did? Yes. So that means if Jesus is right, it means his word never fails. And we can always count on it. You see, he says, now, how many people you see that walk up to you and say, hey, um, I'm, I'm, my name is Jesus. I'm, I'm the actual Christ. You'll, you'll never hear, probably see anybody say that. Okay. It's their position. They, they, I, I've heard them even say, I'm going to set you free today. No, we don't set anybody free. God does. Okay, God's got the power. Antichrist is uh, against Christ. It's against Christ's position. That's what Antichrist means. Um, many will misuse the name of Christ for a dishonest gain. So that's why it says that they'll even try to, to, to see, even if possible, the elect. Now, the elect are the ones that have trusted in the work of Christ. They have believed, they have eternal salvation, they're secure in the Lord. And when they have received that, uh, the Lord puts a seal on them, puts a spear within them. They now can see what the truth is, but now can be led astray in the wrong direction by a false teacher and thereby ruining their walk. This is the Lord's time and this is something very, very important. I'm, I'm unblocking and unveiling 
the truth that people try to hide. Because you can't hide. Jesus said you'll know them by their fruit. Okay? He says, if, any, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or there, do not believe it, for false Christs and false prophets will rise. So in other words, they're going to try to deceive you, to pull you away, for, the, for what purpose? For their own dishonest gain. And we'll see that right here, Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through 5. So I charge you, therefore, before God and the, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Be watchful in all your things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Now, this is very, very important. Now, when they say, he says to be turned away from the truth, remember I said that God puts his spirit within you and you as his seal within you. You know what the truth is because he's in your heart. Now, Someone could come along at the false teacher and pervert your walk, pervert your way. You know, and he could be a blind leader and you don't even know it because you, you're fresh in the faith or you have never been taught uh, or, or received the, the correct education, if you will. And so the result is a messed up life because you go by what they say to do and really it's not correct. It's a fable. And what is a fable? A fable, it, you, it's something made up. I always tell somebody, you know, if you're going to tell me truth, give me scripture. I want to see scripture behind it. If if there's no scripture behind it, I don't want to hear it. Because if it's no scripture, it's just your opinion. Because the rule of life is the word of God. It's proven uh, true and, and sure and steadfast philosophically and, and, and using epistemology even. You can't disprove the word of God. The problem is, is that we have so many people like this in the church. And because we have so many people like this in the church, it's literally ruined the reputation of God. And what I mean by that is that the Bible says in, in, in the book of Romans uh, chapter 1 that, that because of you, his name is blasphemed, you see, among the nations. So, so you know, it's because of these fables that we've heard, what people make up, and there's no, there's no strength and what they say, there's nothing backing what they're saying. Uh, they make up things just to make you feel good because you have an itching ear. And whose fault is that? that well, that's yours. If, if, see, sometimes when we grow in the Christian walk, we'll say, okay, we, we've read the Bible. Everything's kind of humdrum. We want something more. We want something fresh. We want something more powerful. And that's where we make a mistake. I'll tell you why. Because <clears throat> that's sensuality. And you say, what? Well, because, see, the thing is, is that we, the Bible says godliness with contentment is great gain. Okay. One lady told me years ago, I'm 44 years old, and she told me when I was 17 years old, she said, coming back full circle, I remember that. I, I, I really embraced that. I learned to embrace that really this year, to be honest with you. And she said, all you have to do is just love Jesus and everything else will fall into place. And I tell you, it just breaks my heart in a good way. Because Jesus is so good, you know. And you just love him and he takes care of the rest. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I shall not be in lack, you know. He takes care of everything for us. Now... He gives us continual, we gave last teaching the long discourse. Uh, thank you for joining, Jolene. We, last teaching, we gave this long discourse on Matthew 23, on the, the pharisaical spirit, the one that is uh, re religious. And I didn't say last time, which I'll say this time, it's antinomian, which is basically against the law. So they're against the law of God but they make up their own laws to try to, to suppress the truth and their own unrighteousness so they can get by with doing whatever evil deed they want to do and at the sheep's expense. And so, and so when, when we're reading this, 
Look what it says in 2 Timothy. Let's go back to the top verse. I charge you, so this is a command, okay? I charge you, therefore, by, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a pastor, right? And also a bishop who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. So in other words, this is his charge as the man of God that he was. He says, so I command you, basically, to preach the word in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, and exhort. But every time you try to rebuke or exhort, people are like, ah, oh, don't touch the man of God. Like, <laughs> that's not what it says right here. You know, the fivefold ministry, I always say, it says to keep us from every wind of doctrine. So we are supposed to do this. And if we don't do this, how are we showing our love towards the person? And that's nothing that it makes me, oh, God bless you too. That makes me a little upset, a little hurt, you know, is when I see people bashing others that have done wrong. You know, don't don't bash them. Just tell them in a nice, nice loving way. You know, have your, your speech seasoned with salt, like the Lord said. In a loving way, say, uh, you know, um, I'm sorry, but this is what I saw. So the scripture said I could be wrong, but I just wanted to bring this before you because I love you and I care about you. You know, I care about your future, that you, whatever seed that you're planting now is going into your future, you know. And and so, <clears throat> so this is what his command is to do. So now if we don't fulfill this command before God, then we are now disqualified from this good work. Because we are commanded to do this. And if we don't, God will remove us and put somebody else in our position until we learn how to follow God. And one of the ways is, which is the hardest one, is to defend truth. The Bible says, let every one of you be ready to have a hope for the defense, to have a defense for the hope that is within you. So, so we need to be watchful, the Bible says. Be watchful in these things. We have to, to watch for the fables. Not to turn aside of them. The fables are people, what people make up. They'll take a scripture here, a scripture over there, a scripture over here, a scripture over there, and they'll all put it together, make some doctrine, and that's what they got. And most of what they pick out of the scriptures all the way around is conjecture. Just conjecture. Arbitrary things that they just make up that they think that you might want to hear. Okay? And so that's what a fable is. That's what, that's what they do. They give you what you want. Why? Because they have turned aside to bad things. Look at 1 Timothy 6, 3 through 10. It says, If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, which is what I talked about earlier, which is like doctrine. It's like wholesome doctrine. Even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but he is obsessed with disputes, arguments over words which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of making money. From such, withdraw yourself. So, you know, it's like, uh, I heard one guy say, you know, uh, he was kind of like debunking the, uh, the, the pastors and the people around that are making like tons of money and being caught doing bad things on the side. You know, Jesus said you can't gather, you know, figs from thorn bushes. You just can't do it. You're either one way or the other, you know. We were talking about uh, false teachers. This is the third edition of it because the Bible uh, speaks about it a lot. And so, therefore, it's important to us to know because it keeps us safe. Um, Jesus gave the most beautiful illustration that, you know, I... I I wouldn't dare even try to give a better one. He said, if the blind leads the blind into a ditch, you know, you know, if the blind leads the blind, won't they both fall into a ditch? You know, well, you, you can't get any better than that as far as understanding what happens to to people when they follow false teaching. Now, um, let's see. In 1 Timothy 6, 3 through 10, It says, if anyone does not, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words. Now, this is the point I wanted to make here. 
What is godliness? Godliness was being of godly nature and character. Okay. Now that can only come by the Holy Spirit. So those that you see that are uh, of works righteousness, in other words, they have to attain it by working for it versus just believing by faith in Jesus for it. Because the Bible says that the just shall live by their faith. So we have faith in Jesus that he does everything for us uh, on that, that we believe that he makes us righteous. We hunger and thirst for righteousness. We shall be filled, he said. Not that we shall learn how to do it. He says, you shall be filled with righteousness. So, welcome back, Jaylene. So, uh, hungering and thirsting after righteousness is is when God fills you. So, a person that does not walk according to that doctrine that God has given us, that, that righteousness is given by faith apart from the deeds of the law, Romans uh, chapter 3, verse 28, okay? And also, Galatians chapter 2, there's plenty of them. Uh, it, it, it says, so in other words, their works righteousness now, they have that same kind of spirit that we were looking at before in Matthew 23. It's the same one. It's a pharisaical spirit. But the pharisaical spirit, we always think it's just a religious spirit. Oh, it's more than that. It's a, it's a spirit that, um, that wants to control. It wants to destroy. It wants to devour. It wants the praise. It wants the glory. It basically wants to take God's position as much as possible without looking like it and still being veiled. Okay, that's the best description of a Pharisee that I could ever give you. Now, uh, he says now here, he says, see now, there. these are the preachers that are doing it for a means of gain. You know, they're using Jesus' name. I mean, I've seen, I don't know, I'm sure you guys have seen YouTube. It's all over the place where, you know, Jesus is the biggest money-making name there is literally like you can use jesus's name and i mean make a ton make a fortune they've all done it they just put his face on something or or, or the silhouette of that of the shout of turin or something like that and they make a lot of money um and or the fish symbols and things like that so it, it's not done from a heart that is sincerely wanting that person saved or healed or touched they want praise they want glory they want gain financial gain because, see, the, the reason why, as I read earlier in 1 Corinthians 2, that their, their eyes are veiled, you know. We discussed it earlier. It's a little bit further down in the chapter. But their eyes are veiled because they can't see those things. But we can because we are of the faith of the Lord. We are born again in Christ. Now, the people that can't see it who are born again in Christ are the ones that have been led astray. So God goes after them. And God strikes the shepherd. Believe me, that... The Bible says that the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So if there's anyone that is led astray, the Lord will bring them back. I can guarantee you that that's his promise. He said that more than one time. So, um, godliness with contentment is great gain. So, so, the, so true godliness is saying, Lord, I can't do this on my own. My, my affections draw me elsewhere, but Lord... Please, you infuse your life. You infuse your righteousness. You infuse your person, your being into me so that I can be just like you and more like you each and every day so that I don't give off the, the odor or, or the effervescence of my presence, but of yours. That it wouldn't be of my glory, but it would be of your glory. Let your kingdom come. Your will be done. I don't want to walk the rest of the way that the others do. I want to walk your way, Lord Jesus. I want to come the same way Paul did, with fear and trembling. I want to come with the sense of inadequacy, that I'm only adequate in the Lord, that my adequacy is of the Holy Spirit, not of myself. And so if I have the adequacy of the Holy Spirit, not of myself, then I can then move in the Spirit. And I've lost myself then. And, you know, and you gain Christ. So the more you do that in your life with everything, you know, it doesn't have to be one particular sin. It's everything in your life. Even just giving up your life as a living sacrifice. Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is what? You're reasonable, not unreasonable, but reasonable service. So 
living your life as a sacrifice, carrying the cross and denying yourself and following him daily is what God says a reasonable sacrifice. It's not even over and above. We count it that way here today in our culture, in our society here in America, where everything is microwavable and everything is instant now, you know, with the phones and such. But really, God's kingdom never changes, you know. So, so we need to always consider that God has blessed us over and above any nation. I've been to so many different countries that don't have hot water. We do. And that, that which is, uh, it amazes me. Unless you go to a five star, you don't get hot water. And uh, so he says, God lives with contentment is great gain. And then he basically kind of echoes the words of, of Solomon when he says, for we brought nothing into this world and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. So in other words, everything that we do here in this earth, in the physical realm, it's all vanity. It means nothing. It passes away. It blows away. And it's no more. But God's word is enduring and everlasting. It says, and have in food and clothing with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich, this is this one. I mean, let's say that you have in your mind, well, I want to be a minister, but I would just, I want to take at least just that. And you know that you probably shouldn't because you want to be a good example. That's where it starts. You see the seeds planted. So we have to make sure that we check our hearts and say, Lord, I always want to be a servant. I never want to be above the people. I want to be below them like you were. I want to wash their feet. I want to be below them and they be above me. Now, can we do that, preachers? If there's any preacher that watches this broadcast or watches this video series, can we do that? Can we just get below just like Jesus did and wash the disciples that were teaching, wash their feet? wash the people's feet, be people's servants? Can we do those things? Can we walk like Jesus? Can we be like Paul and having no self-sufficiency? Uh, the Bible says, he says, uh, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. You know, and we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. And ourselves, if we do, for your sakes, you know, so he said that you might know who we are. And so that we are a based people. We are not people who elevate ourselves above you. And he furthermore said in chapter 10 that, that, that who, you know, that who, open up your hearts to us. No one's wronged you. Uh, uh, you're in our sphere. You know, uh, you, you belong with us. We're not above you. We never said that. We never acted that way. But yet those that you want to have rule over you with that pharisaical spirit, basically, who discount my ministry, Paul was saying, basically, you want them to rule over you and, and treat you as such when I don't do such things. You know, and that was his argumentation uh, logically uh, with them. He It's like the Bible says he reasoned in the synagogues daily. He also reasoned in his letters, too. And so uh, it says, for those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare. See, it's a snare. So once the seed is planted in your heart, it grabs you. So that's when you need to be like, whoa, 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 Lord, please remove this from me. Get it out of your house. Sell it. Give the money to the poor, like the Lord said, and get it off you. It's not, it's not worth, it's not worth losing your greatest love. It's not worth uh, uh, loving that more than you do Jesus. You see, Jesus gave his life for you on the cross. And that's why we love him. That should be enough that we should never have an itching ear. We should always have a deep revelation of the great love and the mercy of God our Father and his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, and listen to what it says here. It says, And many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. It drowns you. Have you, any of you ever been in an ocean? I've been in the ocean where it's, it's like gone over the top of me and I'm caught in one of those, um, can't remember what those things are called. Help me out here. What are those things called? The jet streams? No, no, no. Um, it's a, it's a tide pool, tide pool. And you're sucked underneath the water and you're drowning. You can't get your head up out of the water. You're like, wait, no matter what you can do, cause you can't touch the bottom. And you're sitting there trying to, 
You're like in a wash machine. You can't get any footing. You can't get your head up above the water. And that's what happens to you. Because see, once the seed plants, remember what James said, that once the seed is planted, that that, that it's once it's conceived, it brings forth a, a sin. And sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death, you see. So we need to remember that we got to kick that seed out and not have any love for money because it's the root of all kinds of evil. For some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And, you know, it makes me, it reminds me, um, I have, you know, I, I and mean, the Bible says to note so, such people who walk such ways. So, but Carlton Pearson, it hurts me to see him because, you know, and you see that people have to do certain things to save something. They will do whatever it takes to save something to tell everybody whatever they want to hear so they can keep their income, their livelihood, their lifestyle. Uh, they can, thanks for joining. They can keep their, their, their way of living uh, lavishly above the saints, which is not the way it should go. We should be below again. Everything I've, I've shown you before in the scriptures and the first two teachings shows that we're supposed to be below, not above. Jesus he took the lowest seat possible. Jesus in Philippians 3 says that he became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. He took the lowest seat. He had the highest seat in the heavens. He disrobed himself of the glory of, of heaven, he came down, took the lowest seat, became a servant of all men, washed his followers' feet. And then one of his followers, he told, go and do quickly what you're going to do. Go deceive me. Go ahead. Go, go betray me, you know. Uh, and like the Bible said, that he who ate bread with me lifted his heel against me. You see, and because why? Because he had the love of money. He wanted that. He wanted that silver. It was like a. It was like a drug, like an addiction. You know, it was a demonic pull. He could not help it. He was caught. He was stuck. That demonic pull. So, Father, I pray anyone watching this right now. I break any demonic pull right now over anyone's life that has been struggling or suffered with this in their life. Anybody that has suffered with any kind of, of, of love of money, Father, we command that spirit to go out of their life in the name of Jesus. We pray, Lord God, release them from it. Release them from it through your word, by your truth, and by your power, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord. Let your holy anointing oil, Lord, flow like a river, Lord. And touch those people, Lord God, who are bound by money, Lord. In the name of Jesus, Lord God, I pray. Thank you, Lord. I believe that you're delivering people even now, Lord. That's watching, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord God. Those that are going to be watching in the in the replay are going to be blessed. But listen, so there's, so there's going to be... Um, it says a, a, a piercing through with many sorrows. And what that means is like at the end, basically, uh, you're, you're pierced through. You're, you're not, you literally just killed yourself, basically, because you did the wrong thing. Uh, the Bible says that if we sow in the spirit, we shall reap everlasting life. If we sow in the flesh, we shall reap death. It's just the way it is. And so Philippians 1, 15 through 18 says, Some indeed preach Christ from envy and strife. So you see this envy and strife again? Now they always go together. Why is that? Because whenever you see competing ministers, and this is what I'm going to tell you, I, I have been talking to ministers for all my life, right? I have trained ministers all my life. You know, they always want to compete. They always want to compete with the anointing. And it's just like, you know something, the anointing was not given to you because you chose to have a certain amount. The anointing is not upon you because you pray a certain amount. The anointing is upon you because God has chosen to do it that way. And if you fast a certain amount of time to be able to get yourself ready and prepared, it's because God put that on your heart to do so. He's leading you by his spirit. Is he not? Of course he is. So who gets the glory? God does. So, so now he says, Some preach Christ even from envy, envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. See, the, the, the love of money is the root of all the evil. It's funny we're talking. I have one viewer right now. I know I've got a bad connection, but it's not that bad. And so many people have come and gone because everyone wants to have money. You see, that's not the, this is not the popular topic right now, but, uh, but it will be soon.
you see, because when Jesus cleans up his church, he's going to say this way or no way, because he's not going to allow his ministers to walk around clad in, in, in platinum, <laughs> you know, in gold and, 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 and luxurious houses and cars and everything else. So that's what you always see though. They always compete with each other. They always fight with each other. And, and it says that some also from goodwill. So some are doing it from envy and strife, but some are doing it from goodwill, from the good will of their heart that they really want to see others saved and they preach the gospel. So they say, he says, uh, the former, which is the ones that were envy and strife, preaching Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my chains because it hurts. It hurts me. You know, it hurts me to see people out there, uh, you know, using the name of the Lord to make money. And you know that they have because it's been proven through their character. Because the Bible said the Bible doesn't lie. Jesus doesn't lie. James doesn't lie. John doesn't lie. And they all say the same thing. You know them by their fruit, basically. And so if you know them by their fruit, then how is it that the gift is going to benefit you? It's not. It may be a gift of some kind, but it's not God's gift. And I'm, it, I just that, that's what the Word of God says. And so, so uh, on your own. Um, oh, and also, let, actually, I want to read verse seventeen. It says, "But the latter out of love." So the latter, which is the one from goodwill. So they preach from the goodwill of their heart, from love knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. Now, what did he say? I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. The defense of the gospel. That's huge. <clears throat> Are you with me? Somebody say amen. 